Welcome to Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canaan, and we're broadcasting live on December 12th from the studios of WMNF in Tampa. And we're going to focus today on Florida's environment this hour. Later on in the show, we're going to hear that an effort to get a water referendum on Florida's ballot next year has fallen short, but we'll hear from organizers that their plan to get the right to clean water amendment on Florida's 26, 2026 ballot instead. That's later on in the show, so I hope you stay tuned for that. But first up, we're going to hear about efforts to stop a proposed development in prime Florida panther habitat in eastern Collier County. It's called Belmar. And joining us now by Zoom to talk about this are Michael McGrath, who is Sierra Club's Florida lead organizer, and Marcella Zarita, a resident of eastern Collier County. She's active in issues concerning developments that might impact nearby wildlife and her neighbors. So I want to welcome you both to Tuesday Cafe, Michael and Marcella. Hey, Sean, good to be here. Well, thanks so much for joining us. So let's begin with the setting for what we're, we'll be talking about. Tell us about how big and where is the proposed Belmar development? Sure, thanks for that, Sean. So um, Belmar is situated over in Eastern Collier County, right? And this is something that would add more than 4,000 homes. And also with it, uh, more cars onto our roadways within Eastern Collier County. Estimates say that the public could, could be up to 45,000 additional daily vehicle trips going through the rural roads um, here in this part of, um, of Southwest Florida. Um, if, if just to provide some context to folks who are trying to imagine where this is, it's only about a mile from um, the Florida Panther National Wildlife Refuge. If folks are familiar with um, the Ave Maria community, situated right around there on Oilwell Road. Um, this is something that really um, right is in the heart of um, Panther habitat, um, right in the Western Everglades. Um, and really is something that would be um, disastrous and create a new um, sprawling community, a cooker cutter community um, in Southwest Florida. Yeah, and that's the voice of Michael McGrath, Sierra Club F Florida lead organizer. We also have on our Zoom with us right now, Marcella Zarita, a resident of Eastern Collier County. So Marcella, maybe you could describe a little bit more about what is, what's this area like? Uh, there's, it's kind of rural, very rural, I would say. It's not far from the Everglades. There's a lot of wetlands. How else would you describe your community? It's, uh, can you hear me? Yes, you you sound fine. Okay, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, well, I live on the rural area of the Golden Gate States, and I am surrounded by all this public land, and um, it's a low-density community, and um, we um surrounded by all this wildlife, and um, especially the Florida panther, um, and I actually, you know, they use our community to be able to go into the public lands. Um, and unfortunately, we have all this um, sprawl because that's what these villages are um, here in Eastern Collier. It is the opposite um, what the IRLS say um, initially was uh, created for, um, you know, back in 1999, you know, the state, um, you know, everybody, you know, was content with uh, this preservation, how much land it was going to be preserved, um, you know, and within years, they changed that. It was never intended to have this much development in these sensitive areas. And it's sensitive in part because it's wetlands, but also in part because the Florida panther, thats this is the main area for where the Florida panther is. Michael, maybe you could describe um, what we know about where the panther lives and where it lives re regarding this develop this proposed development and how much room that panthers need to live. Sure, thanks for that, Sean. Um, so yeah, I think it's really important folks to realize that the Florida Panther um, utilizes a, a uh, mosaic of public and also private lands, right? And also working landscape as well, agricultural lands. So, you know, to the south of Belmar, um, we know we have um, the, um, the Florida Panther National Wildlife Refuge there. We also have the Big Cypress National Preserve and the Fakahatchee Preserve. And then north of there, we also have um, various um, public lands as part of the crew um, lands, which are the close to regional uh, watershed um, lands that are located within. Uh, Lee County and also Collier County, right? So you can see that there is this this wildlife corridor, right? And that um, really it's actually, all these lands are actually part of the um, this, this shared vision to create the Florida Wildlife Corridor, something that would go from the Okefenokee Swamp all the way down to the Western Everglades, right? So these are these are critically important lands. And we know from what from the state agencies and their research using 
um, telemetry data, right, which is basically the radio callers that go on the Panthers. That this is, um, these are lands that um, the Panthers utilize um, very regularly, right? Um, you know, if, if Belmar was developed, right, and again, I, want, I can't underscore this enough, Belmar is 100% in the primary Panther zone habitat and also 100% in the Florida Wildlife Corridor. There's estimates that it would take about three to four Panthers per year, right? And then, you know, when you add to the fact that we're also going to be adding all these different um, uh, road, um, cars on, on the roadways and in, in when an area where there's not as much frequent traffic because um, there's not people out there already, um, we're going to see more and more vehicular collisions with the Florida Panther. This year alone, according to FD, FWC, there's already been um, 13 documented Panther deaths. Um, so we you know if we continue to do things like this, um, we're going to see that number um, increase in the, in the years to come. So 4,000, potentially 4,000 homes in this area that's prime panther habitat, but you're part of several environmental groups who have filed for a temporary restraining order? That's correct. That's correct. Yes. So um, the EPA, I'm, I'm sorry, Earth Justice on behalf of Sierra Club and also the Center for, Center for Biological Diversity um, uh, made a motion for a temporary restraining order um, for the two um, 404 wetland permits that we were trying to challenge for two different developments. So the first ones we're talking about right now with, um, with Belmar. Right. The other one is another development um, over in, um, in southeastern Lee County. I'm um, near, again, those on um, this crew lands I was referring to earlier um, called Kingston. Right. And basically, um, our, our, our hope is that, you know, they will be briefed and also argued in court in the coming months and help delay um, the permitting of these, these, uh, these developments. Our guests are Michael McGrath, Sierra Club Florida lead organizer and Marcella Zarita, a resident of Eastern Collier County. And we're talking about proposed development in Florida Panther habitat. Just a reminder that coming up later in the show, we're going to hear about an effort to add the, to the Florida constitution, a right to clean water. This is Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan, and we're broadcasting from the studios of WMNF in Tampa. And just a moment ago, Michael, you asked you you mentioned something called a 404 wetlands permit. So for those of us who aren't familiar with that term, what is that? Sure. So a um, 404 wetland permit basically is something that um, that you have to get through um, that through FDEP, Florida's Department of Environmental Protection, right, in order to um, develop a private property of land, right? Um, it basically takes into consideration. Um, the impact that we could have if you were to dredge and fill that wetland and also create a new development. What's really important for the audience to understand is that this used to be a program that was was actually um, federally administered by the EPA and also by the Army Corps of Engineers. Um, back during the, end, the waiting days of the Trump administration, um, they actually transferred the authority of the for wetland, wetland program actually to the state, to FDEP. And really this was a gift for developers, right? Um, it actually has helped to actually streamline the processing of this and also make it easier for them to have to have federal oversight with um, trying to get these um, for, 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 for wetland permits. And we know the reason why this is done, because developers are lining the pockets of the current leadership within um, at federal levels at the time and also um, within, the store, within the state here in Florida as well. And basically, it's, it's a way for the way that the, the rules have been set up makes it easier for developers to actually um, get authorization to um, dredge and fill wetlands, as we see on places like Belmar, so that they don't have to have as much red tape um, for, um, for trying to um, develop these very sens ecologically sensitive lands. I want to bring Marcella back into this conversation. And Marcella, this the, the, the proposed development, it's called Belmar. It's in the neighborhood where you live, near the neighborhood where you live in East Collier County, this rural area which is near the Florida Wildlife Corridor and near, it's completely in uh, Florida Panther habitat. So um, would you be concerned about increased traffic there and potentially more vehicle strikes with Panthers and, and other damage to wildlife in your neighborhood? Um, absolutely. Um, we have actually already had the issue. Uh, we have brought out to the county, um, um, County and every single meeting that they have for for these villages, River Grass, um, that Imaku Road, our area, it's not even our schools are overcrowded, um, you know, and it, it just you know it, it can't support this much traffic that they're planning to bring, and especially where uh you know the Panthers are you know like the hot spots for like for example Imaku Road Village that's another village that they're trying to build that right on the middle heart of uh the Corsica Swamp all this land um that is surrounded to it and there it's a hot spot for Panthers and they're planning to build with the high density 
it continued to rezone change um, to, so to make sure that the developers make a profit. They say very openly at, at the meetings, at the public meetings, you know, that as it right now, you know, it's not profitable. So they change the rules, they change all this stuff, rezoning to make it profitable for the developers. Um, you know, and one thing they forget is that, you know, wildlife, it's a public trust, you know, they're supposed to protect it. You know, we gave them that, we put them on in that position to, you know, listen to the public. I remember the meeting at the River Grass Village, which was the first one that started all this villages after that. You know, that room, they have to open the third floor because it was full of people against this project. But the commissioners, they ignore it. And, you know, there's the data. They were supposed to, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, you know, they were supposed to do a study every five years, you know, for the endangered, for the panthers, and they haven't done it. But yet they continue, you know, not uh, authorizing even permits. And I hope that this time, I mean, because there is no other place left for them. This is it. This is the last place for the Florida panthers. And it is a concern not just for the uh, Floridians, but it should be a concern for because it's an it's an species that it's close to go to extinction, and this will be a jeopardy pro, um, project. Um, and I hope that that the, the permit gets denied. That's Marcella Zarita, a restaurant, oh, a resident that is of Eastern Collier County. We are also speaking with Michael McGrath, Sierra Club Florida lead organizer. We're talking about a proposed development in Florida panther habitat. This is Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan, broadcasting from the studios of WMNF in Tampa. The developer told the Naples Daily News, he said this, Collier Enterprises is dedicated to being good stewards of the environment and has committed to preserving 12,000 acres of high quality wildlife habitat as part of the town of Big Cypress, Belmar Village and River Glass, Rivergrass Village projects. So, Marcella, there will be these 12,000 acres that will be protected. So that's, that's uh, um, isn't that a, a, a good thing? It would be a good thing if, we, um, if it would be elsewhere, not right next to a refuge of an animal that it's close to go to an extension. I mean, there is no conservation if it leads to extension. I mean, if we're paving the way, we know that this place, I mean, the conservancy have gave them options where it would be best. You know, the the panthers, they don't know that they have to go to the specific um, areas that they're supposed, because that's where we are assigning to. They don't know that. If they're building a primary panther habitat, you know, the wildlife, they don't know that. I live in this area. I see the wildlife tail road every morning, uh, every time when I come back from work. There is no wildlife crossing they're working on some of them but you know i i recall in one of the meetings for the immokley road village you know at the last minute the applicant they did change and did not want uh you know they they agreed at the beginning that they will assist with the wildlife crossing and then at the last minute for the voting they back up so it, it's you know it, and besides the crossings as well that they don't um, they do it either at the end of a project and not at the construction at the beginning. I mean, the the location is bad. I mean, you you like I said, you cannot say that you're uh you know you're gonna conserve this much land and you know while you're building on the mainland. If you go if you look at the satellite, this area it's dark. There's it's black, like you won't see anything else. This is where all the wildlife is. And you know, and like I said, they don't know that, you know, you're going to be building, we're, we're talking about the possibility of being tw uh, twice the size of Colorado, you know, uh, and so what are we doing? We're just going to save a little bit of pits of land while we're destroying the majority of it. You know, that, that's something that we got to think because it's not about right now, it's about future generations because the panthers, you know, just not the, if, if you look at into a whole picture of what we what the people before me you know um did everything to conserve this it's also their habitat it's also what it gives us you know um and and that's one thing that i think that we need to take account as well saving the florida pantry saving us as well for future generations 
So a few times in this conversation, we've talked about potentially the the Florida panther going extinct with uh, increased development in in Southwest Florida. But maybe, um, Michael, you can tell us about what do we know about population numbers for the Florida panther and habitat uh, needs and where where the direction of the Florida panther population is going. Sure. So, um, Fritz will say around, around the Florida panther that there's maybe around 120 to 230 panthers left in the wild. Um, I think when we're talking about an endangered species that is so significant and special as the Florida panther, we're talking about the um you know, and the South Florida ecosystem still today, right? We should always be erring on the side of caution, right? We're always using the lower estimates field field to inform our biological opinions about you know the continued recovery of this Florida of the species. Um, but frankly, the biological opinion that has been released by um, Fish and Wildlife Service of the other development that be happening in addition to Belmar within the region, talking about um, Lee County, Henry County, Glades County, and Collier County, right? All these communities have uh, mega development. Michael, you seem to have some buffering Our problems. Maybe community. if you turned your video and off, your audio might improve sorry to interrupt you there but um we'll come back to you and let's go right now to marcella and um i'm being promoted next thursday right sorry sorry michael i'm gonna mute you because you're 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 buffering a little bit so maybe yeah there you go um Let's ask Marcella about the uh, a development that Michael mentioned earlier, and it's called Kingston. So, so far we've been talking mostly about this Belmar proposed development, but what do you know about the Kingston development that's proposed? Um, I know a little bit um, that that's another project that it's a big no-no in my opinion, um, because the same thing, the problem right now, what we, we're going through with having all this communities and high density being built is that there is not enough um, contribution from the developers when it comes to schools, traffic, the environment. There's a lot of uh, things that have been changed. And I think that all this is coming now to Florida. Um, not that it was planned, because if we go back to the initial plans, it, it's the contrary for what was presented to the public. Um, I think that the big... Um, the big issue here is that not, there is, we don't have uh, like a department to oversee these projects. Um, I think, you know, once Riz got, when at the time he was the government, you know, the, he dismantled the Department of Community Affairs. You know, that was the Florida's growth management uh, law where, you know, it would have, uh, go over everything, traffic, schools, wildlife, endangered species, the water quality, all that stuff. And we don't have that. Every time we go to these meetings as the public, every time we go, it's always the same issue, you know, and there is no solution. We just continue building. And um, so, yeah, um, I mean, this is another um, urban sprawl. Just, it's just sprawl. And it, it doesn't, it's just a profit for the developers in my opinion. <clears throat> Our guests are Marcella Zarita, a resident of Eastern Collier County, and Michael McGrath, Sierra Club Florida lead organizer. We're talking about a proposed development in Florida panther habitat in southwest Florida in Collier County. I want to remind people that coming up later in the show, we're going to hear about an effort to add to the Florida Constitution a right to clean water. This is Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan. We're broadcasting from WMNF. And Michael, we can let me ask you about other species that might be impacted if there's more development there in Southwest Florida. Tell us about the crested caracara and um, how it's it might be impacted by less habitat and and other uh, issues concerning development. Sure, are you able to hear me? Okay. Yeah, you sound great. Thanks. Okay, great. So yeah, on the Belmar site, there is actually a um, documented uh, case of two um, breeding. A, a, a pair of breeding caracara um, on the site, right? And um, if this were to go through, um, they would lose um, over half of their foraging um, habitat site that they actually need to actually sustain themselves, right? This is in, having those forage sites locations is extremely important for the caracara so that they can actually continue to maintain their, their healthy level of fitness. So they can continue to, um, to, to breed and have offspring. 
to basically maintain a healthy population. If you take away the sporge site, they're going to create more interspecies conflicts with other care care in the in the region, and, they, and they also won't it'll continue to um, dwindle in numbers. So um, this is just another example of a, of a really iconic and also a special species of, of great concern here in Florida. That's um you know only found here um in our state, and with a with a every with every year passing, its range becomes um, more and more encroached upon by development. And earlier, you mentioned the Florida Wildlife Corridor, which is a proposed uh, area of nature from the, the north to south Florida. How close is this development to that proposed uh, wildlife corridor, and how would development of of this Belmar proposed Belmar development how would that impact whether or not the uh, Florida Wildlife Corridor it becomes a reality? Sure. So for, for folks who weren't here earlier in the conversation, um, I just want to again underscore that um, Belmar is 100% within the Florida Wildlife Corridor, right? This is something that, um, you know, state leadership, both of the governor and also the legislature have made a priority for Florida to help connect um, our, our mixed uh, mosaic of public and also private lands. So we can make sure that this is something that's enjoyed by all Floridians for generations to come. Um, you know, this is, this is, this development is 100% um, primary panther habitat, right? And I think it can't be underscored enough that you know, when you look at the landowner who is trying to develop this Collier Enterprises, they do have land that they own the title to that is actually outside of the Florida Wildlife Corridor, right? So if they wanted to be, be better stewards of the, of the land, right, and actually do things that would be good for conservation ethic and helping to secure this shared vision for um, the Florida Wildlife Corridor, they should be developing lands that are outside of that, right? And this is this is good for a myriad of reasons also, right? Um, because this is also be putting people closer to um, the urban centers where the jobs are, right? And also will allow, this, that allow them to create um, more affordable and also workforce housing as well in that part of um, of, 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 uh, of Collier County in Southeast Florida, right? We shouldn't be causing more burdens for, for our residents to be able to have these long commutes if they're trying to look for affordable housing or also for, um, for, new, for more places to live. We should be putting them close to their urban core so we can cut down on that transit um, time and also uh, commute times for folks and not have folks spend more money on gas and also uh, their appreciating um, car uh, upkeep. Up We're speaking right now about the uh, potential Florida panther habitat being destroyed by a proposed development in Southwest Florida. And we're broadcasting from the studios of WMNF in Tampa live on December 12th here. And we have a couple of emails we can read. You're listening to Tuesday at Cafe. I'm Sean Canan. First of all, Rich in Brooksville comments on something that Marcella was talking about earlier. He says that light pollution is real and it wipes out insects, animals, and wildlife in general. We need to take it very seriously. So thanks for that comment, Rich. And then Leslie points out that the Path of the Panther, the, the show from Carlton Ward Jr., just opened at the FMOPA. And the reception is tonight from 6 to 8 is what Leslie is telling us. So thank you for the, those two emails that came in. And as we wrap up this segment of the show, perhaps, Marcella, maybe you can tell us if there are any meetings that are coming up or any hearings, uh, if any decisions will be made soon. Marcella or Michael could weigh in on that. Um, meetings in regards to just Belmar or in regards to the projects around? Yeah, so any of the developments, are there hearings or, or public meetings coming up? Um, we're waiting on the Mockley Road Village, which is near the um, Horse Screws Worm Sanctuary, <clears throat> uh, the Florida Catwalk, um, and all these public lands. We're waiting for, because they're also waiting for a 404 permit from the state. Um, and then we, uh, that's the one that I know of uh, that I'm waiting because I, I was following up with this permit for a while and uh, and, and that, because that really concerns me because that one has the hot spot for the Florida Panthers and um, they do it, they did so much changes in the county level. Um, and so that's the one that I'm, I'm looking um, and following up on. Well, it's right you. behind my backyard. <laughs> well, I want to thank you both for coming on WMNF's Tuesday Cafe, Michael and Marcella. Thanks for having me, Sean. Appreciate it. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Michael, Michael McGrath is Sierra Club Florida lead organizer, and Marcella Zarita is a resident of Eastern Collier County who's active in issues concerning developments that might impact nearby wildlife and her neighbors, and we've been talking about a proposed Collier County development called Belmar in Florida Panther Habitat.
You're listening to Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan. Thank you. Right now, we're going to turn to our, our next topic, and that is Florida water. An effort to get a water referendum on Florida's ballot next year has fallen short, but organizers plan to get the right to clean water amendment on Florida's 2026 ballot instead. And so joining us right now are Captain Carl Deigert, the chair of the Florida Political Action Committee, Florida Right to Clean and Healthy Water, and Joseph Bonassia, the chair of the Florida Rights of Nature Network. Welcome back to Tuesday Cafe, Carl and Joseph. My pleasure to be here. Yeah, thanks so much for joining us. I've already um, gotten to the news that your proposed amendment won't be on next year's ballot, but we should back up a bit and start with, let's say, Carl, if you if it does eventually become state of, part of the state constitution, what would the right to clean and healthy waters amendment say and do in Florida? So what this will do, it will give legal standing to every citizen in the state of Florida to hold the state executive agencies accountable um, for uh, to make sure that they do the job that we hired them to do. It's not about monetary reward or seeking damages. Um, it just, the courts will compel the state executive agencies to enforce the laws that are already existing to prevent, to stop harm or to prevent harm to our waters. Essentially, um, it would give Floridians the legal standing to sue to protect the right to clean water if a state agency harms or threatens to harm Florida waters? Yeah, so this is going to this is a constitutionally guaranteed fundamental right. This this right to clean water will carry the same weight as the freedom of speech, freedom to religion, even to bear arms. It's at that level of uh, law, and it will um, supersede um, a lot of the existing regulations and um, legislature. It also provides a framework for the legislature in their decision making process. They will have to first reference the state constitutional amendment for clean water in every decision they make regarding water quality uh, throughout the state. And until recently, you had been gathering signatures, trying to get the initiative on next November's ballot. But Joseph, we'll turn to you. In an opinion column last week, you noted that those efforts had fallen short, but that you had plans to take the efforts that you've made so far and push for 2026 instead. Does that give you a better chance to hit the nearly million signatures that you'd need next time? Um, yes, it does. We would not be starting from scratch again. I mean, petitions would go to zero, but we have a level of a public awareness that we did not have when we launched on Earth Day back in 2022. We would have uh, the public records list of the 115,000 people who have already signed. Uh, with adequate funding, we can do a mail campaign and have those folks sign right away. We have also attracted the attention of professionals who think that what we have accomplished on purely volunteer efforts and what was a shoestring bu budget, quite extraordinary. So they're looking to help us out with their uh, expertise, with sufficient funding. Uh, we feel very good about our prospects for 2026. And you mentioned that the petitions would go to zero. So that brings us to a recent change that was imposed by the Florida legislature to the time frame for signature gathering. How did that impact your efforts and, and what was that change that we're talking about? Okay, well, years ago, prior to 2011, you had uh, four years in order to collect the required number of petitions. In 2011, the legislature change that, they cut it in half. So now we've got two years to collect approximately 900,000 petitions. It is an intimidating task, but still doable with sufficient public uh, awareness. The challenge really isn't convincing Floridians uh, to pass a fundamental right to clean and healthy waters. The challenge is simply getting enough of them to know about the petition so they can sign it so we can qualify and get on the ballot. There certainly is a history in Florida of Floridians supporting environmental initiatives. So we're very confident that once we're on it, we're going to uh, pass with flying colors. It's just getting the resources, the financial resources, um, the man hours and such to get those 900,000 
of signed and verified petitions. And the legislature obviously was looking to discourage success in that regard. That's Joseph Bonassi, a chair of the Florida Rights to Nature Network. We're also speaking with Captain Carl Diger, chair of the Florida Political Action Committee, Florida Right to Clean and Healthy Waters. We're talking about a constitutional amendment push that they're making now for the 2026 ballot for a right to clean water in Florida. This is Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan. And uh, Carl, let me ask you this, that in, in an opinion article that you wrote in the last year or two, you said that over 9,000 miles of our waterways and 80% of our springs are now classified as impaired. What does that mean? So through state monitoring, our own state agencies are telling us that these water bodies <clears throat> have become uh, polluted. They use like to use the word impaired, but um, I'm not one for euphemisms. Um, let's call it what it is. Um, our waters are unsafe. Um, we have harmful algae green, bl blue green algae blooms in Lake Okeechobee. Actually across almost every lake in the state of Florida, we have these blooms now. Um, we have the most polluted lakes in the entire United States uh, per square, um, most square miles of polluted lakes in the entire United States. So our water quality is at a point of essentially no return. If we don't get a hand on um, the sources of pollution, we will not be able to reverse the damage that's already been done. The money that the legislature throws into the water quality programs is about remediation. That whole paradigm of trying to fix it needs to stop, and we need to start moving towards prevention. And the only way that's going to happen is as we create this law to um, compel the agencies to do that very thing, to stop the pollution at the sources. Our guests are Captain Carl Dyer, chair of the Florida Political Action Committee, Florida Right to Clean and Healthy Waters, and Joseph Bonassia, who is chair of the Florida Rights of Nature Network. We're talking about a constitutional amendment push that they're making for the 2026 ballot. This is Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan, and we're broadcasting from the studios of WMNF in Tampa. And we're live on December 12th. So if you have any thoughts, you can give us a call, 813-239-9663. You can email us at dj at wmnf.org or text 813-433-0885. Here are a couple of emails that have come in in the last few minutes. Uh, Paul, CP from Palmetto is referring to the previous story, who and he says that you will see that CE, which is Collier Enterprises, has been screwing over Florida for decades from oil drilling rights to development. So that's the opinion of CP in Palmetto talking about our previous topic about the de proposed development in Southwest Florida. And Eric from Riverview, Riverview says clean water, the clean water amendment is great. How will this guarantee the state legislature implements it with a track record of the Republican majority not implementing previous amendments? I feel this will never happen. I would have signed a petition had I known about it. Not sure why this is the first time I'm hearing about it. So that's from Eric in Riverview. What can you say, either Carl or Joseph, um, what's the track record for and how, how would you be certain that the Florida legislature would actually implement this amendment if it becomes part of the Florida Constitution? Well, so, once, it's in, go ahead, Jeff. once it's part of the Constitution, that's the law of the land. State agencies do not have the discretion to ignore the state constitution. This is a fundamental right of the people a court could compel the state agencies to do what they must do in order to protect the right of the people. Um, that pretty much was a quote that I was using from a court case in New York, one of their first uh, Green Amendment court cases, where the DEP up there uh, was being taken to task by the court. And the judge said, state agencies do not have the discretion to ignore the state constitution. Same thing down here. I also want to note that this is a self-executing law. It does not need any further legislation from the legislature to implement it. When the people pass it, it's effective. Yeah. I'd like to add to that. Um, our, the authors of our amendment language, they uh, assemble previous successes and previous failures for constitutional amendments they went over this language word by word for several months to ensure 
that it will pass um, and self-execute um, with uh, out any input from any uh, legislature's uh, action. You're both part of the Florida Rights of Nature Network. I'd like to find out what that means, rights of nature. We'll take that one, Joe. Okay. Uh, yes, this is a uh, actually a global movement. And a couple of years ago, back in 2020, actually, Florida made history when uh, Orange County voters amended their state, uh, amended their county charter to give legally recognized rights to all their waterways. Every waterway had the right to exist, to flow, to be free of pollution, and to maintain a healthy ecosystem. Right now, nature has, has no rights. And so it is, it is at a great disadvantage in courts of law. So the thinking behind rights of nature is that uh, like other rights movements, it would provide the protections we need. It's worth noting that corporations have lots and lots of rights that people have. And it just um, balances things in the courts for nature to have those rights as well. So I'd like to point out um, about the rights of nature success in Orange County. You know, that was enacted by 89% uh, of the voters in Orange County. Um, bipartisan support for um, to give rights to waters themselves. Um, that case has been tested, um, but just prior to the people of Orange County um, deciding that this was the best law for their community, our own state legislature preempted the creation of rights of nature laws throughout the state about three months prior to the Orange County success. So we're now um, the folks in Orange County at Speak Up Wakaiva are um, appealing the decision to um, that um, is allowing a developer to tear up 115 acres of wetlands in the first test case for rights of nature in the United States. So we're trying to have that preemption reversed and, uh, and hopefully that will happen because after we accomplish the right to clean water, we hope to extend these um, environmental protections to nature itself. Uh, Sean, I would like to add to that as well. Of course, it, was that, it was that preemption that compelled us to launch this initiative to amend the state constitution. That was not our original intention. We were a network of these local initiatives. The legislature put the kibosh on that, which is why we're doing what we're doing now. I think it's also worth noting that the legislature must believe that a rights-based approach to environmental protection would be very effective or else it would not have enacted that preemption. Our guests are Joseph Bonassi, a chair of the Florida Rights of Nature Network, and Captain Carl R. Diger, the chair of the Florida Political Action Committee called Florida Right to Clean and Healthy Waters. And we're talking about a constitutional amendment push that they're making for the 2026 ballot this is Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan, and we're broadcasting from the studios of WMNF Tampa. We're live on December 12th, and so we're going to take some calls right now. If you have thoughts about this, you can give us a call at 813-239-9663. You can email dj at wmnf.org, or you can text 813-433-0885. And Carl in Clearwater wants to ask about the how the declining water quality impacts Florida businesses. Go ahead, Carl. So I, I have personally I'm been affected. totally in support of this group and their work. Um, I, I think we're not spending enough time and energy educating people about the long-term consequences of declining water quality and its effect on business. It, it's going to have a huge negative effect on business over over the next 10, 20 years. Thank you. If you'd like to go ahead, Carl. Yes, yeah, so um, he's absolutely right. Um, I believe water quality, um, water quality is what makes Florida our blue economy. Um, it's 
the tens of billions of dollars are brought into the state each year because people come to visit and, and enjoy our clean waters. Um, I personally um, was financially impacted. Uh, the red tide of 2018, I owned a waterfront motel, small mom and pop, just four rooms and uh, in Matt Lachey, Florida, and from which I conducted boat tours out to the barrier islands of Cayo Costa in Captiva. That red tide event took my businesses to zero. The businesses on Fort Myers Beach, Sanibel, uh, became ghost towns. Uh, the employees of these businesses were standing in food lines because they had no wages coming in. Um, yes, I believe uh, deteriorating water quality will uh, eventually and imminently uh, bring a economic collapse to the state of Florida if we don't get a handle on it. Sean, I, I would just I would just add that there was a study done about that 2018-2019 red tide. It cost Southwest Florida $184 million in direct tourist dollars and $305 million in indirect dollars. So um, the fact that it that poor water quality poor, poor water quality affects our economies down here is, is absolutely clear. And we'll get to more phone calls in a second. So DeAndre and John, hang tight. We'll get to you in a moment. I want to read some of these emails that have been coming in as well. And just remind people that our guests are Captain Carl Diger, chair of the Florida Political Action Committee, Florida Right to Clean and Healthy Waters, and Joseph Benassia, the chair of the Florida Rights of Nature Network. David writes in, he asks, would this proposed amendment help to address the problems from leaky septic tanks? And David says he thinks a lot of poo ends up in our aquifer from all the septic tanks in rural areas and cities like Spring Hill. Uh, any thoughts about how how uh, leaky septic tanks would be impacted by an amendment like this? So a municipality with um, that's mainly septic and has not moved to sewering, um, central sewering, um, if those septic tanks are harming the local waters, um, an action, even the municipality could litigate with the state executive agencies to compel them to find the funding to sewer their communities. Um, again, this is not about seeking damages. It's just to, so um, in the court could tell that agency, probably the DEP or the water management district, um, they're gonna say that they don't have the funding to do this. If we had the funding, they would have done it already, right? So. They're going to cry poor. They're going to say that we don't have the money to make these conversions to sewer. The courts will compel these agencies to go find it. Do something, do something, but you got to, you got to make this, this is a fundamental right. It's being violated and you need to fix it. So it's very powerful. And Sarah from Tampa is, is asking, do we have to sign a person, a, a petition in person, a physical petition, or can we sign an online petition? And maybe that would, um, that also leads to a, a second part of that question, which could be, are, are you taking petitions now, or is there a certain window at, at which your petition gathering will start again? So uh, unfortunately, the state does not permit electronic signatures. So every petition must be a hard copy with what they call a wet signature, blue or black ink. We launched, as I said, uh, back on Earth Day in 2022. We are just now really at the end of uh, November, suspending our petition gathering efforts. We're not close enough to uh, really to merit continuing our efforts anymore. But we are, you know, redesigning, uh, retooling a campaign, and we intend to relaunch again in February. So those people who signed petitions over the last 18 months or so, they will have to sign the new petition when it launches again in uh, later on in the winter. Yeah, yeah the, our legislature makes this as difficult as possible. All the signatures we've collected to date are now null and void going into the next election cycle. So please, people, if you signed the first time, Sign again. Uh, we're going to need your signatures again, and I want you to take five petitions and hand them out to all your neighbors. Let's go back to the phone lines. Uh, DeAndre has been waiting for a while. Hi, DeAndre. What would you like to say? I want to thank uh, I want to thank you and the the guests uh, for this forum. It's terribly important. Um, I also want to ask a couple questions. One, 
is there a history listing and then there like update on a front uh a had on the water um when it comes to different um the governments whether it's municipal county and then state i'm thinking about um uh, construction uh, uh issues on the hillsborough and downtown now a few years ago but then as well it seems like uh the, the, the governor at the time uh, a few years ago also uh, raised the, the rate of uh, pollution permitted in uh, waters, whether it were standing or flowing waters. And then uh, secondly, um, are there any interesting renewable uh, industries like the floating, uh, the floating farms uh, or, or the such that uh, has caught uh, your organization's attention that you feel is worth mentioning um, for people to kind of get excited about. All right. Thanks, DeAndre. So there's a lot of projects across the state um, working to improve water quality. Um, and there's a lot of good stuff out there, technology. The problem with technology and ways to fix our uh, waters is that the technology is very difficult to scale to filter or to sequester the nutrients from trillions of gallons of water. So there are technologies that work, um, but they really cannot be scaled to the level soon enough, quick enough, efficiently enough to make a difference. We have to stop the pollution at the sources. Thanks for the call, DeAndre. And a reminder that if you're listening live on December 12th, you can call us at 813-239-9663. You can email dj at wmnf.org, or you can text 813-433-0885. And uh, while we're, um, one of the questions that I wanted to ask our guests here has to do with a water battle that our audience may be familiar with, and that's the application for a permit to take about a million gallons of water a day from the Ginny Springs complex in North Florida so that it can be bottled for sale by a company that's now known as Blue Triton, but it used to be called Nestle. The Florida Springs Council tweeted recently that the Suwannee River Water Management District will vote this morning on whether to follow a recent recommendation by a judge who ruled in favor of the company Seven Springs to allow the pumping uh, I was watching a little bit of that meeting before the show here. I, I saw a county commissioner up there get up and say that taking a million gallons of day of water a day out of the Suwannee River was like taking a teaspoon out of the river. Is that's what this county commissioner had said? So let me ask my guests what could what could that mean for water flow and the quality of water and the environment near Ginny Springs in North Florida? Well, we already know that it's having a de detrimental impact, which seems common sense to most everybody. Uh, it certainly resonated with 19,000 uh, residents, citizens who made public comments about this particular case. The vast majority were in opposition to this permit. Uh, one of the things that is interesting about this case is that the Florida Springs Council argued two things. Number one, that this level of consumption is going to hurt the aquifer and the springs and therefore would not be in the public interest. And number two, that these 19,000 comments represented the public interest. The court rejected both of those arguments. Uh, what is also particularly interesting here is that in Florida, we do not have a good definition of what the public interest is. It is not defined in our state constitution. Our legislature has not defined it, nor has our Department of Environmental uh, Protection. So it was a surprising, I think, uh, decision that came uh, down from the court, surprising certainly to those 19,000 people. So when an environmental resources permit is uh, intended to be issued by the Florida Department of Protection, um, there's a public hearing or there's a public comment period um, before a um, DOA or a um, administrative hearing, a, a judge. And they always apply this concept of public interest, but the legislature's never defined it. And then when they apply it, 
those that need to meet the public interest have no definitions or uh, hard facts that they need to prove that they've met it. Um, I've been recently uh, involved in a case in Cape Coral, Florida to prevent um, harming of the waters through the removal of a boat lock. And the seven points of public interest are, will the activity adversely affect public health and safety? Will the activity adversely affect the conservation of fish and wildlife, including endangered species? Will the activity affect navigation, the flow of water leading to harmful erosion? Uh, and will it adversely affect fishing recreation values and marine productivity such as scalloping and, and oystering? And is the, the uh, activity permanent or temporary? So that's just five of those seven points that they use, but um, it's real easy to uh, apply to Jenny Springs that overconsumption of these waters that are finite, they're not infinite, um, can, is not in the public interest, but uh, the, you know, the DEP moves ahead and issues a permit. And what permits do is make that illegal activity of taking that water for profit and greed and making it an illegal activity. That's what our permitting system does. Well, let's try to squeeze in a phone call here uh, from John in Port Ritchie. Hi, John, what would you like to say? Real quick, two things. I like the idea that the environment is a, is a person. So would that be a federal amendment or a state amendment? The second thing is, I don't know if you're familiar with these conservative courts using this concept, this legal concept of uh, it, it's not historical evidence that these things existed and they've been overturning various laws based on this historical reference and they're going back to this constitutional originality stuff. So where in the Constitution does it say corporations are people? Where is that an original past or original thought by the founding fathers? And can we challenge that based on that historical precedent? All right. Thank, thank you, John. And uh, um, we're, we have to separate, make sure we separate the ideas of the federal constitution from the state constitution of Florida, which is what your amendment would be, Carl and Joseph. That's the Correct. And, and, and the gentleman caller is talking about granting rights to nature and that uh, there are other countries that have it in their federal constitution. We do not. There are some places in the country, townships and municipalities that have done it. No state constitutions that I know of at this point. They could be there. They would be very powerful with place there. Well, I want to thank you both for coming on. But before I let you go, why, why don't you let us know where people can find out more about the Florida right to clean and healthy waters and the petition drive that you'll be starting again in February? Where can people find that information? They can go to FloridaRightToCleanWater.org. And we're going to put a link to that on the WMNF.org website. So I want to thank you very much for coming back on WMNF's Tuesday Cafe, Carl and Joseph. Thanks for bringing right, the thanks. awareness. We really appreciate it. Yep. Yeah, thank, thank you for having us. Thanks so much for coming on. Captain Carl Digert is the chair of the Florida Political Action Committee called Florida Right to Clean and Healthy Waters. And Joseph Benassia is chair of the Florida Rights of Nature Network. They hope to add a question to Florida's 2026 ballot for a constitutional right to clean water. And I also want to thank our previous guests, Michael McGrath and Mar Marcella Zarita. And if you missed either of these interviews, the videos should be published on WMNF.org early this afternoon. I want to thank our phone screener, John Dunn. You've been listening to Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan, News and Public Affairs Director at WMNF Tampa. During this time slot tomorrow, Shelly Reback will host Midpoint. Coming up next is Wavemakers with Janet and Tom Sherberger. Their Wavemaker today is Michelle Detweiler, President and CEO of Park Center for Disabilities in Pinellas County, a nonprofit. This has been Tuesday Cafe, coming to you live on December 12, 2023, from the studios of WMNF Tampa, St. Petersburg, Sarasota, and Lakeland. In this time slot next week, we're going to hear from the supervisors of three local school districts. So I hope you stay tuned. I hope you tune back in to Tuesday Cafe next Tuesday at 10. Thanks so much for listening and supporting WMNF.org.